This year, many of us have realized that we need our gardens more than ever. So every week on this series, I'm delighted to invite you to my home so that we can go gardening together. One of the most creative parts of gardening, I always feel, is sowing plants from seed. It's just, it's just magical, really, that these tiny seeds will produce really beautiful flowers. So I'm using a wildflower mix of seed. I'm doing it in a crate because I'm going to surprise my mom, who's living just in the city with a balcony for a garden. If you were sowing directly into the ground, you'd rake them in very, very lightly. And I've put more of the compost in this plastic pot and I give it a dusting. And then the magic really starts to happen when you activate growth in the seed. And you do that by giving the seeds a good watering. And all of a sudden, the signal will be sent to those seeds to start growing. I've just sown those now. Six weeks ago, from the same packets, and look at these amazing corn flowers and cosmos. The bees have been buzzing around this tray. So on my mum's balcony, within weeks, this is what you'll have, and this is what you could have too. So... This is quite exciting. Somebody who really likes to do flower arranging. And imagine they live on top of a hill, a little bit windy, views all around, absolutely glorious, but they want a little bit of shelter to grow these plants. The Montgomery family from Bambridge have been putting a garden redesign at the bottom of their to-do list. Now they have just four weeks to transform it. So I thought it would be great to have some professional advice. I know Mum's been looking to, to get something done in the garden for a long time, so I thought that would sort of spur, spur the whole process on a bit. I don't know how many times she's been out there with bits of rope and whatever else, trying to make a plan. <laughs> I love flower arranging, so my, my real interest is um, in creating beds so that I can just walk out the door and get both flowers and foliage. My, my daughter, last year got married, I, through ignorance, uh, said I would do the flowers for a wedding and uh, took that on, not having really a clue what I was doing. Um, had an absolute ball of a time, really, really enjoyed it. And it, it's with an eye to that as well that I want to develop the garden. It's just nice to relax out in the garden, whether you're weeding or just picking flowers or cutting back or whatever. It's just, it's just been so close to nature that... Yeah, yeah, I sadly enjoy weeding, so... Mm. <laughs> Hello. Hello. Hi. Great. So, David, will you show me the garden? So, this little space, that this is the space that we want to, to do up. Mum has already got some a flower bed here and some nice potted Very plants. Good. But then it's just, this area is just grass at the moment, so we want to do something a little more exciting. So how do you see it? What would you really love? Well, I'm thinking probably of something a wee bit sculptural, and then I imagine maybe two mirror image uh, kidney-shaped beds, and something like a modern arch, maybe creating some sort of a feature between. Wonderful. I think I'm going to ask you to design a garden for me. <laughs> no. OK, I'll get on with that, and lovely to meet you. Thank so you. You too. Bye. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye. Wow, with such a strong vision, I really need to think carefully about what I can bring to the Montgomery Garden. Now, many of you have been sending in your gardening questions by email, by video, by social media, and I'd like to tackle some of the more unusual and some of the most common. Now, this one from Kevin in the Cooley Mountains in County Loud is a little bit different. He grows vines and he's been growing these vines in a greenhouse. Last year, he put two of them outside. The reason you do that is so the vines have access to water outside because they're very thirsty plants. But the one that he left inside is doing very well, producing lots of fruit. The ones he brought outside aren't. 
Kevin, the answer is really simple. The two that you've brought outside are in shock, and they will be right through this year. The one inside hasn't been moved, so it's doing okay. The ones outside will be okay. Just give them plenty of water and a bit of feed this year, and next year they'll be back to producing fruit for you. Well, I've got this sunny afternoon. Oh, I love this. We've inherited a large country garden that's largely lawn with a few trees. We'd love to encourage more wildlife. And we're wondering what can be done, keeping in mind we have a young, busy family to look after, so not much time for gardening. Oh, this is perfect. Wildlife and Phoebe, my botanist friend, go hand in hand. Over to you, Phoebe. Your grass, if you leave it, you put your feet up, don't cut it so often, then it will start to develop into a meadow. Wild meadows are really interesting right now. A lot of people are interested in growing them because we have a focus now on pollinator plants. And we're trying to support pollinators to return to Ireland because they're very threatened. Their habitats have been lost. Management that we've been doing in our gardens and on our farms hasn't really helped them over the years. This is Yorkshire fog, this grass here. It's really soft and furry, the whole thing, and it has like this slight purple color to it. So a lot of people, as they let their grass grow longer, they might see this one coming in. If you're interested in wildlife, you could put up bat boxes, you could have a bird table, bee hotels. There's lots of things that you can do to support wildlife in general. Developing a meadow is a complex situation, though, so you'll need to keep an eye on it and see what wildflowers grow in it. There's loads of insects that like long grass, so overall wildlife will do very well in long grass. There you go, there's the answer. Let it go and let it grow. Most of us have walls or fences at the boundaries of our garden. We build them and then we don't know what to do with them. You're in that situation, Liz. Actually, I can see your fence growing in front of my eyes. Yes, that's right. Getting erected after a long wait. It's finally happening. So the carpenter is there, and immediately he's finished, you want to cover up his work? Yes, I'll say that quietly. <laughs> yeah, I hope he's not listening. Uh, you can, there's a number of things you could do. You could paint it a very, very dark green, and that does help disguise it. Something like a British racing green uh, can be very good, but you probably want plants, and plants are beautiful as the boundaries to our garden. There's a lovely rose, which would do very well in your situation, called American Pillar, and that will clamber up the fence and will climb in it, and at this time of the year, next year, it'll be full of pinkish flowers. Absolutely beautiful. Just give a dollop of farmyard manure in the planting hole, mix that in with the soil and the compost, and that should be happy. That sounds fantastic. Yeah. It'll green up the place. Uh, but again, keep that a secret between you and me or the carpenter might disappear. Definitely. Until he leaves anyway. <laughs> nice to see yeah. you, Liz. You too. Bye. It's time to meet another friend of mine, Dara. He's an amazing gardener. He's particularly good at creating gardens from pots and containers, which are generally used in small spaces. Now, that's surprising, because Dara is head gardener on a massive estate. The estate we're on is an 18-acre estate of mature woodland, mixed with a large amount of magnolias and rhododendrons. There's also large herbaceous borders, vast meadows. You couldn't write my job, I love my job. Uh, I wake up every morning happy to go to work. I've never had a, a day that I've wanted to go out and not garden. So I've always worked on large estates, but in my own garden I've always opted for pots, mainly because they can be transported and I tend to be lifting and moving them and kind of checking them more because they need that little bit more attention. So this pot is a key example of it not just being one plant, one pot. In this pot, I have a whole year's interest. I have it from spring bulbs all the way up into lake flowering begonias. I then have the brunnera, 
And then after that goes, I have an air sema that will come and flower, and I have the main show plant, which is the Scheffler and Macrophylla. Uh, that will stay there all year round as my full winter interest, and then as the year progresses, I have full interest coming up constantly. Planting in pots, it's a lot more labor intensive. The fact that it doesn't have access to a large volume of soil or nutrients, underwatering is always a big problem. Although it rains, if you think about how much space you have within the pot, it doesn't take in the same volume of water. Generally, the easiest way to check a pot is by lifting it just to see the weight. If it's full of water, it's going to be much heavier. If it's dry, it's going to be much lighter. Key to all gardening is soil. When you're in the garden or whether you're in the pot, it's always the soil. So drainage is key. And like just like in the garden, pruning is really important. You want your plant looking the best, and especially when you're combining plants, you want them to, to mingle well. If you're gonna go for growing pots, I would go for woodland perennials. They're used to drying out. They don't need that fertile soil. So anything like Virginias, Portophyllums, Persicarias, any of the, the woodlanders are very good for it. All the principles in, in a garden situation are still there in a pot situation. It's not just about having one plant doing a show, it's about using plants together in order to get the right results. So the pot display here is it's, it's quite flat at the moment. So to give depth, just like I would in a border, I'm gonna try to raise some of the pots up. So one of the tricks is to get your terracotta pot and turn it upside down. So very simply, all I have to do is put the pot down, another pot on top. It's giving a tiered effect. It does two things. It, it changes heights and gives depth, but it also gets the plants up to your level. So I found that I'm much more attached to my plants in my pots than I would be in my garden, mainly because they're in my space of where I sit and enjoy my time. They generally tend to be higher and closer to you, so they tend to be on your balcony where you're sitting down. So that's one of the really enjoyable things about growing pots is that you can really get in close and get detail. I've been really inspired by Dara's collection of pots, so I'm going to plant up my own. But it won't be just me. I'm going to have a competition with Paul, who works with me. Gardening shouldn't be a competitive sport, but it absolutely is. This is Paul, who I work with every day, and we both fancy ourselves as good planters. And he reckons he's better than me. I'm going to show him by planting up the best pots that you can imagine. It's summertime and people want instant impact and they want colour. So I'm going to be going floriferous, the biggest, brightest, most beautiful colour I can find. And straight away I see it with dahlias. I'm in dahlia heaven. I'm going down a bit of a cooler route with some nice shady plants for a courtyard or a place that doesn't get as much light as your brash garden might. Brash? Brash, yeah. So, this is a bit more calm. This here is hydrangea, pinkachu, carex, everest, and then this trailing variegated ivy. The old concept of a thriller, a filler, and a spiller off the side of the pot. A great combination. I think for impact in the garden, you have to go big. Go big or go home. I've plenty of subtlety in the garden already. For pots and containers, I want va va vroom. <laughs> So, we've all had a bit of a tough year, and dahlias are the thing that will cheer us up from midsummer on. These will be perfect for beds and borders, but they will also make amazing display. The geraniums will take a little bit of, of drought. They don't mind drying out just uh, a little bit, and they'll come back really fresh. And look at the colours, just look into that plant. Now, for instant gratification for us, and almost everlasting colour during the summer. Nothing beats him. Ah, he's doing his best. Actually, he's doing really well. Time for the giant pot off back in my garden.
We've got very different plants, luckily. I can assure you I won't be coming near any of yours. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. So I'm going to leave you. I have some work to do on the Montgomery is gone. So I'll get scribbling. Bro. Yep. See you later. So this is slightly different to normal. It's a house plunked in an exposed site with brilliant views. But they have come up with some very direct, very strong designs. And I don't know how open they are to those designs being adapted or changed. But I figured that they know what they want. So I'm not sure. I'm not sure they want me. Their plan consists of two circular lawns with a pathway and an arch. My big worry is that the flowers they want to grow need protection. So I have an idea that will mean adapting their plans in a way that will reflect the gorgeous surroundings. But I'm proposing something slightly radical. These turf cairns or torques rising up out of the ground to create some shelter and to reflect the hills beyond. When I'm done, I'll come out to play. When I'm done, Using their vision as a template, I revealed my plans to the Montgomerys. And with only four weeks to complete the job, they seem to have gone for it. Well, apart from my one major design feature. Even these ones? Hello. Hi. Welcome back. Hi. How's progress going with the garden? Going well. Yeah, no, we're getting the piven down here, so. Oh, I see it, two circles. Yes. Straight away, those lines have taken away from the angles of the house, and it looks very gentle. Yeah, definitely. Very good. Now, can you show me the mounds that have been made? James told me that you weren't planning to use turf on them. James is the project manager. No. It's going to be nearly impossible to get anything else to grow on mounds. No, we had just imagined that there was something that that would stick to that, something a bit more weatherproof. And there's not some sort of a very sort of hardy, low-growing thing that would... There are, but you'd need so many of them and you'd be taking lots of weeds, so it's just that grass is the easiest thing to look after. Yep. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. Uh, is James there? Yeah, he is, yeah. Oh, there's that big beaming smile that <laughs> I love to see, James. I have to wear a coat today, Dermot. <laughs> And we're, we're going to look at the potential for planting the ridges. I, I, you told me the other day that it wasn't going to be turf, it was going to be some sort yeah, of plants. Yeah. It's a challenging place for plants. If you can encourage the ridges to have as much body as possible, as much height, so we they'll add yeah, some protection yeah. to the rest of the plants. Yeah, but everything else there is, is, is great. There's a lot of, lot of work after happening here. OK, I have my little countdown clock on. <laughs> this is going to be a very exciting one. Best of luck. Thanks, Dermot. Okay. Bye bye. bye. I can only hope that James can persuade Gladys that the grass-covered mounds will offer much-needed shelter for the flowers and also give the whole garden some sculptural interest. It, it looks great. It looks really good. No, it is really lovely. Good. And, yeah. yeah. And Dermot's idea was that it actually mirrored the, um, the shape of the, the hills and the mountains the surrounding in the hills, background. Yeah, so yeah, that's yeah, really yeah, nice, yeah. actually, that it, it draws your eye yeah. out of the garden as well. Absolutely. So you're looking out over mountains too. Yes. <laughs> Far away mountains. It's beautiful. Yeah. 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 The whole mountains. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Are you done already? Not yet. So, you have a shrub, you have bedding plants, you have 1970s ground cover, whereas me, I'm going for... You're going for a psychedelic... Pure zinc. We have a little bit of height with these kissy salvias, then the verbena dance around them. The dahlias really come up as explosions, fireworks of colour, and then draping around the side, we have the sunshiny osseospernums. So this is a pot that, even on the dullest day, should brighten your mood. 
I'm going down a shady kind of courtyard, cooler look, lots of nice interesting foliage texture and ferns are brilliant in pots because they're quite low maintenance. You don't need to do much to them, but the effect they give is quite magic. I'm going on the whole basis of filler, thriller and spiller. The filler being all the bottom plants like the fern and the grasses. The thriller is this hydrangea. This is a pinkachu in full bloom. And then the spillers are the likes of this finca and the ivies that sprawl down the side of the pot and just soften the pot. Yeah. Yeah. I think we all know. Mine, it's for summer colour and it will explode. We've put some really good compost in there. It'll be watered well, it'll be fed every five days, which is important at this time of year. Even a breeze going over all this foliage and flower will dry it out. But in the autumn, I'd take all these plants, I'd move some of them into the greenhouse, I'd put them in the beds and the borders and I'd change the planting. I'd put some bulbs in for the spring. And it's always more interesting if you keep changing things in pots because you want maximum value because it's a small space. Who wouldn't want that arrangement of plants in their garden? Enhance your garden with accents at different times of the year, but in summer, you want colour. Many of us are gardening in increasingly small spaces, awkward spaces where there's no access to soil in the ground. So I have to bring everything with me and I'm going to create a balcony garden. And who better to do it for than my mum? <laughs> Reverse. Get in before the door prunes the pad. Very good. And she would live at the very top, wouldn't she? Out here. Beautiful. Many people will have spaces like this. It might be your first garden, or like mom, you might have moved from the suburbs where you had plenty of open space to do what you want, but now you're restricted to a space two meters by three meters. It needn't be a balcony, it might be a yard, it might be a light well, or it might be on top of the roof. What do you do? I'm going to show you. So, first of all, I'm giving Mum some of these seats, which I use in my own garden. So this is a nice midsummer into late summer planter. I have salvia, I have lavender, cosmos, that wonderful nasturtium. And the thing that's really got to bring this into the autumn is this red dahlia, giving a little bit of height to you. That gazania there, that's just such good value. It comes out when the sun is shining and it is so bright. And one seed isn't good enough. She might meet a guy. So here's your new garden. It is absolutely stunning. Do you like it? Absolutely. If you have a small space, yeah. you have to be very careful. So you have your seat for yourself. Uh, all the pots of different types. And see that crate there? Yes. Yeah, Wildflower yeah. seeds sown oh, in that. Beautiful. So they will Lovely. begin to pop up. Every couple of days, water, and once a week, a liquid feed. They'll all be happy. Absolutely beautiful. You like it? Thank you. Thank you. Mm, you're beautiful. welcome. Enjoy it. Bye. Bye. Having a balcony garden means that at least my mum never gets wet, which is more than you can say for the Montgomerys, who've worked tirelessly through weeks of summer rain. I wonder, though, have they taken my advice and gone for the grass mounds? So I'm on my way to see Gladys and David and Dad. 
to see how they've got on with their garden. It hasn't been plain sailing, and there is a bit of trepidation. Let's see what they've done. Dermot had suggested mounds, and I just couldn't envisage what that would look like at all. And um, David and Ian have worked really hard at sculpting them. They were quite hard to shape because uh, no sooner had you one section done and it looked perfect, but then you looked at somewhere else and that didn't line in exactly with what you'd done before. There was a lot of padding in and to get the soil up, it would all just fall down before you got to the top. But there was enough of it that by the end we were pretty good at it, so it was nice, <laughs> <laughs> nice to feel good at it. Once you realised that we just worked at a section at a time, it was grand. And there was a real sense of completion last night. I think we only finished it last night about 10 o'clock or so. So just putting in uh, the last plant was, was a cause for celebration. <laughs> nice soft day, isn't it? Hello! Ah, <laughs> oh, Ian, how are you? And the, the master landscaper. Look what you've done. Oh, it's very effective, isn't it? Yeah, uh, yeah. I've brought you a few chairs uh, you. that can be set in the garden because it's such a lovely location. Let's have a look. So the idea of the planting is you want to do a lot of flower arranging. Yep. They're all planted quite densely, so that's going to cover up very, very fast. Great. And look at this. <laughs> oh, that is really wonderful. So it frames the view. You feel almost like you're going into a vortex. It's sucked in. Yeah. And then, through this torque, it just feels all very curvaceous and gentle and draws you in, doesn't it? Yeah. And using turf. It was a challenge for you to get your head around it. Yes, I couldn't. No, I love it. I, I didn't actually like it until the turf went on. And then all of a sudden yeah, it makes sense. Yeah, it did. What are your favourite plants? I love the salvia. There, there's quite a bit of salvia dotted about. The other one that's very handy is this epimedium. So that's going to be right. a low-growing ground cover. OK. And then these montbretias will be in flower. Uh, very, very soon. So you have loads of different colours. Uh, lupins coming up. Do you think it'll be easy to keep, to look after? Everything except the mound. <laughs> the mound will be, it won't be that difficult because grass, if it's on a slope, it grows at a slower rate. Okay. So if you just treat it like a mini hedge, 20 minutes or so with a shears will. <laughs> Mind you, I should take that advice myself. <laughs> It's not really wet. <laughs> <laughs> if you get over the wet, it's lovely. They're very comfy. The nice thing about those chairs is, as you're driving in, if you just see them set almost as sculptures, uh -huh. they set the idea of relaxing, and that's what a garden should yeah. be. Yeah. So enjoy your garden. It's been great to go gardening together with you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.